For this recording, we're going to focus on the week four lecture. So again, apologies again for uh, cancelling the lecture at short notice, but due to the power cut, we couldn't really run it as a live webinar. But we'll, we'll look at this as a recording because a lot of this uh, material, IS1, should be a recap from AF1 uh, in any regard. So in terms of recap of week three, we finished accounting measurement and there's a small recording you were to look in terms of the conclusion of accounting measurement. Um, what you really need to focus on is the concepts. So what is the concept of historical cost accounting, CPPA and CCCA? So do you understand what they kind of purport as how accounting should be done? And then can you do the calculations for each? There won't be overly difficult calculations, but again, the, the basic ones in terms of the ones we've done in class and in the question pack are the standard that you should be expected to be able to complete. The other thing to note is you should be able to finish now the multiple choice quizzes, which are online uh, on loop. There's four of them and just reflect on that because what we're starting now this week and week four is really the recap. And we're starting into looking at the double entry again. We're starting to look at financial statements and the more traditional accounting that you would have been used to in AF1. So we're going to start with IAS1, which is your financial statements. And between the end of this semester and all of next semester, we're going to introduce new topics and new accounting standards. Standards, and we're going to look at preparing a bigger IS1 question at the end of this module. So for this week, week four, you have a tutorial up there on accounting measurement. So that is up there, including a solution and a video walkthrough, if you want to look at any particular aspect of it. And we're going to focus on IS1 and IS34 for this lecture. And there'll be a separate recording then of an IS1 question if you need it. So we're going to look at a question called key to limited from the question pack. But again, for a lot of students, you may be up to speed on this already, and you can just compare your answer to the solution and you may not need the video walkthrough at all. Just as a reminder for next week, there's no live webinar for AC220 because it's the AF2 reading week, but there is a week five question pack up there. So try and take a look at that. And the continuous assessment will either go up later this week or at the start of next week. And I advise you, it's an individual ass assignment. Take a look at it during week five and week six, and we have it scheduled then in week seven to, to discuss that in class and we'll take any questions as well. The deadline will not be till the start of semester two, so there's no immediate time constraint. So don't worry too much about trying to get it done before the end of this semester. Uh, you'll see the closing date is not until I think week two of semester two. All right. Now what I was planning to do until we got um, uh, the schedule got disrupted because the power cut was I was planning to put a couple of polls up, but I'm still going to put them up here just for you yourself. Right, answer each of these questions and see well, was I on the right track. So the first poll I was going to put up was what does CPPA stand for? So recapping on accounting measurement. So which of these would you choose if you were asked what does CPPA stand for? Right? And of course, the correct answer here should have been the first one, current purchase power accounting. CPPA looks at the current purchase power of items by adjusting for a general inflation rate. Right? The next question was going to be uh, in times of rising prices, which accounting method would give the highest profit available for distribution? So in times of rising prices, i.e. in times of inflation, which one would give the highest profit available? And the answer there is historical cost accounting, because we know that's a limitation of HCA. When prices are rising and when you're using historical cost to calculate profit, it will overstate profit. Now notice I said profit available for distribution. Because if you went to CCA, for example, they would have business profit, which may be higher, but not all of that is available for distribution because there's the distinction between holding gains and your operating profit. So the answer there would be historical cost accounting because it overstates profit. The next slide or the next poll, should I say, this is a relation to a thing you should have looked at the recording from last week, week three, is around the fair value and a relatively recent movement in the accounting standards looking at an increasing inclusion of fair value as a measure in the accounting standards. So what is the relatively new IFRS that is dedicated to fair value? So which accounting standard is dedicated here? So again, you make a call yourself. Have you looked at it last week? Do you remember? The answer, of course, is IFRS 13. That is a whole accounting standard just dedicated to what is fair value, how do you measure it, and what do you have to watch out for in certain circumstances? Because it's quite an important concept uh, in accounting. And the last question I was planning on looking at, but it's no harm as a quick recap. Which of the following is true in relation to current purchase power accounting? 
So have a read of those four statements and think about which one, you might even want to pause it, which one am I going to say here is true? That should say is. So capital, inventory, and PP are all monetary items. Well, that's false. They are all non-monetary items. The likes of cash, bank, trade payables, trade receivables, they are monetary items. Monetary assets lose value in times of rising prices. That is true. Because if you have cash and prices are rising, the value of that cash in terms of purchasing power declines. And that's why we have to calculate a gain or loss in monetary items when we do CPPA. Monetary assets gain, that's not correct. All right, monetary liabilities gain in value uh, in times of rising prices because the, the real value of the debt will go up. And monetary items are restated to the price level adjusted value, that's incorrect. Monetary items are the only item in a CPPA set of accounts which are not adjusted. They're left at their normal uh, value from the start of the period. So again, I, unfortunately, we just didn't get a chance to put those on Zoom and uh, use the power code. But just to give you an idea, those polls are helpful just to think of the smaller things to consolidate your knowledge in these particular areas. All right. The other two po poll questions I had was kind of setting us up for this topic now we're going to look at, which is IAS1. Because again, all of this really should be recapped from your AF1 days, from your AC120 module last year. So the first question was, how many financial statements are in a complete set of accounts as per IAS1? So how many financial statements? Two, three, four, or five. Well, the answer here is four. You have the statement of profit and loss and other comprehensive income, single statement. You have the statement of financial position. You have the statement of cash flows, which we will cover later on this year. And you have the statement of changes in equity. So all of those make a complete set of accounts, including in the notes. But the notes aren't technically a financial statement in themselves. So it's four financial statements in a complete set. And the other question, which is often catching students out, is in which financial statement would you see a line item for dividends paid? So think about this now. Where would you see dividends paid as a line item? The correct answer here is the statement of changes in equity. Right? The profit or loss or other comprehensive income, they're the same statement most of the time. Uh, you would never see dividends in there. Dividends are not an expense to be shown in the PL. You would never see a line item for dividends in the statement flange position because it's always part of retained earnings, so it wouldn't be a standalone item. But you would see a line item for dividends paid in the statement of changes in equity. And there's just a small, simple things covering in, covered in IAS1 that we're going to go back over now at the start of this class. So it's not a huge extra technical material this week, but there is a revision because I'm going to give you a couple of IAS1 questions to complete. And we're also going to look at IAS1 questions for two tutorials uh, that are coming up after reading week as well. So we'll look at IAS1, which is a recap, and then we'll introduce IAS34 as well. But I said, hopefully this will really just be a revision and it will be examined again this year. So if you look at any past AC220 paper, there will be a big IAS1 question. The only difference between this year and last year is you have a lot more adjustments and new accounting standards brought in because we cover a lot more accounting standards now, particularly in semester two. And if you want to get more detail, you can go to the IAS Plus website. That's very useful for all the new accounting standards we cover. So you can go in here, you can copy and paste it in, and you can see it will cover, for example, IAS 1. It'll tell you when it was brought in back in 1974 and all the updates that have happened. So it's a nice summary of what the key issues are for IAS 1. And when we go and we cover other accounting standards, I will give you the link to IAS Plus as well. So it's just a nice catch-all website if you want to read up a bit about a standard or get a different explanation. All right. So IAS 1 is all about the presentation of financial statements. It says how the financial statements should be structured, what line items should be there, it tells you how you present them in terms of current assets, non-current assets, and the core accounting concepts, like going concern concept and the accruals. And all of that is basic knowledge, which we're expecting you to bring forward from your studies in AF1. And it's not gonna be hugely taxing to students uh, in this year. All right. So it requires a complete set of financial statements. And as I've said in the little multiple choice, there's four financial statements in a complete set. But as well as that, there's accounting policies and explanatory notes. They form a core part of the set of financial statements. So if you go and look at any set of annual reports, 
you'll have your four. They might take up 10 pages, but these could take up 200 pages. That's where all the detail is in a set of financial statements. So for example, if we go back and we just Google, for example, we look at Glombia annual report, because all of these are available publicly. You get their annual report for last year. Let's see, can we get a copy of it here? The reports. Report here. Annual report. We'll download the PDF just to see as an example the Glambia. So the first bit of the annual report, there's a huge amount of detail for the first 100 pages. But then the financial statements, if you look at them, are page 125. Right, so go on. So you have your group, you have your income statement, statement of profit or loss. Then you have your group balance sheet, which is your statement of financial position, and your statement of change in equity and statement of cash flows. So that's only four or five pages. But then if you go to the notes of the accounts, the notes of the accounts run about 70, 80, 90 pages. And in your financial statements here, they will reference the notes. So that's an important thing. We're starting to see a bit more detail and we'll bring, give you more sample annual reports in semester two. But you can Google them. Any company that's listed in a stock exchange, Ryanair, Glombia, and you're looking at your Facebooks or even the Irish companies in terms of Paddy Power, Betfair, any of those, they will have annual reports, Kerry Group, etc. And just to get an idea of how much information is there and what a complete set of financial statements should look like. So we'll delve into them in a lot more detail in semester two. All right, change of title is a balance sheet now known as the statement of financial position. Sometimes they're still used interchangeably. The income statement is now known as the statement of profit and loss and other comprehensive income. We usually keep that as a single statement. This is the first section of it, and this is the second section. You can also keep it as two separate statements, like what Glombia have done here. They have an income statement, which they finish, and then they start a group statement of comprehensive income separately. But you can keep them as a single um, statement as well. So there is choice there. And finally, the cash flow statement. We will be looking at that in semester two. So that's its own international accounting standard, which is IAS 7. All right. So it's just blocky. It can be in either a single statement or two. And this shouldn't be uh, new to people. You have your two years usually because you have to have comparative information. IAS 1 says that. Then you have your profit for the year after tax. And you have a separate section for OCI other comprehensive income. The main one we would have in OCI, which you should be familiar with from last year, is revaluation gains or losses on property, plant and equipment. So that will be your IAS 16. That's the only main one we're even going to have this year as well. So we'd usually treat it as a single uh, section, which you could have two different ones, like what Glombia had, where you finish profit for the year, you start a new statement with a new heading, and you start with profit for the year. But it's still going to have the same answer at the end. It's just, there's a choice there what way you want to present the PL. But the key thing is the, high, the line items that are used, the order that they're in, and the fact that you have two columns, one for the prior period for comparability, all of that is mandated as part of IAS 1. All right. So your other comprehensive income, the main one we call go through OCI, is your IAS 16. And we'll revise that again in semester two, the revaluation of property, plant, and equipment. Sometimes that used to be called the revaluation reserve or revaluation surplus is what we used to call it. Statement of financial position, it's broken into assets are always the top half, non-current assets current, and then equity and liabilities at the bottom half. Just bear this in mind, particularly if you're coming off leaving cert and you might you might be used to having a finance buy section, etc. All of that has changed now. So you don't put in, for example, here current assets less current liabilities. It's assets on the top half. Non-current plus current gets you total assets. And on the bottom half, you have equity plus current non-current liabilities and current liabilities gets you total equity and liabilities. Because remember, that's the basic accounting equation. Your assets equals your liabilities plus your equity. So we split the statement of financial position in two and we present it in that format. Now, the second column is still required. Even when you go, for example, back to Glombia and you look at their group, what they call the balance sheet, back up here, they will have two columns. Now, they actually give three columns, but certainly two are the minimum 
for comparability. And that's under IS1. Right. But again, that shouldn't be new to you. Just make sure you're happy with the presentation because that's what will be expected in any IS1 question in AC220. Statement of change in equity was one that you would have covered as well last year. Key prime statement. It looks the movements between opening and closing balances on your key equity items. Share capital, you could have share premium, retained earnings, and other reserves. For example, there, your revaluation reserve. Right. There will be an added complication that we'll cover later on in the, the year about prior period adjustments. So if you make an error in a prior period or change in accounting policy, uh, this will impact the statement of change in equity. For now, I just want you to put an asterisk there to remind you when you study IS8 later on in semester two, there's actually a link back here to statement of change in equity. And your statement of change in equity is in columnar format. And whatever number of items you have in the equity section, of your statement of financial position, i.e. here, you will have columns in the statement of change in equity. And you reconcile it between the opening balance and the closing balance. Right, so that's important that you understand statement of change in equity is usually done last because you need the balances in the statement of financial position and you need the balances in the statement of profit and loss to fill it in. So we'll go back over two or three of those questions just for practice and we'll also have two tutorial questions uh, just to get you up to speed but for now they're really just revision ones when you come to later on in semester two we go through past exam questions which also focus on these statements but with a lot more adjustments based on the, the international accounting standards we'll cover in semester two right. the additional content we will have to do a statement of cash flows so for example, they have a group statement of cash flows here. That's something you may not have seen unless you may have done leave and cert accounting. You might have covered it there, but don't worry. We're going to cover that in detail the start of semester two. It's a core financial statement and it's part of the whole package. You have to give comparative information and that's clearly given with your two columns. You have to give that at a minimum under IS1 to allow people to compare the movements and you have to give accounting policies uh, given. So for example, if you go here, they gave the summary, the significant accounting policies is the second note. And they say the, the going concern and the basis of how they've done all their accounting. And that's required in every set of accounts. If you go, for example, Green Core annual report, Green Core, which is based in Northwood and Santry, and you go to the results center and we get their annual report. Let's see, can we see anyone here? Green Corps annual report. Let's just have, have a look just to show you and illustrate. Green Corps, they make all the, the prepared salads and sandwiches. So if you go to Marks and Spencer's, most likely anything you're buying there is made by Green Corps. So they have a table of contents, I'm sure. Maybe not. So we'll come down maybe halfway through and we look at the financial statements. So the annual report, it is a lot more information. We'll talk about that when we get to financial statement analysis. But about halfway through, you have your group income statement for two years. You have your group statement of comprehensive income. They do it separately. Your group statement of financial position, two years. Assets in the top, equity and liabilities in the bottom. And your group statement of cash flows. And the first note that they'll have is the statement of accounting policies. So there's a nice consistency there and you can see their actual their head office is in Northwood, just up there close enough to DCU's Class 11 campus. But have a look around some of them just to get the layout. Again, not every line item is going to make sense to you because we haven't covered all the accounting standards and some of them you won't cover till AF3 um, in, in that particular financial reporting module. But we're starting to build our knowledge now in terms of the layout, assets, the top, equity, liabilities, the bottom. The layout, of, for example, of a statement of change in equity, which is columnar, going from the opening balance in September 18 to the closing balance in September 19. So we're getting a good idea of the overall framework of financial statements. And what we will spend the next couple of weeks and semester two at then is building on that and seeing what particular elements will cause trouble and where particular accounting standards can help give us rules about how to count for those particular items. But for now, we're really just focusing on refresh. There's a question pack three, and I'm going to do a recording on one of those, uh, Keith Limited, just to practice journal entries and preparing a set of financial statements. 
there's going to be two tutorials in week six and week seven on IAS1 questions. And also remember those multiple choice quizzes that I gave you um, online through Loop. All of those are supposed to be recapping on basics you covered in AF1. So when you come to question pack three in the tutorials, there will be bad debts. There will be accruals and prepayments. There will be depreciation. There will be disposals of assets. And you need to be able to be comfortable with those. So there's a bit of uh, prerequisite work to get up to speed. Either of those textbooks will be useful if you do want to go back and read a different aspect on it. And remember, you can do the scan and send service for the DCU library if you feel like you want to get access to one of those textbooks, but obviously physically cannot get on the campus to get it, all right? So it's not the longest of lectures, uh, particularly in IS1, because this should be revision. Go back and look at your AF1 notes, maybe look at some of the questions there and have a look at the question pack three to make sure you're happy enough with how to approach each of those. Then keep an eye out next week when we look at uh, your tutorial for week six. Uh, that question is gonna be an IS one and one of your questions in the week five pack, which is up on loop, also covers a past AF1 exam question. Just so we can get back into the swing of things, how to do debits and credits, how to finish off a trial balance into a set of financial statements. Because if we have that done well, it makes the next step onto the rest of AC220 uh, that bit easier. All right, so that's recapping IAS1. Another small standard that I want to cover here that you wouldn't have come across before is IAS34. And this is what we call interim financial statements. Now, for listed companies, they have to prepare interim financial statements. Because again, if you're a listed company, your stocks are traded on the stock exchange. And that means the investors and the stakeholders in that stock exchange, they want information on a more regular basis than once a year. So if we go back, for example, and we take Glambia, and we look at, for example, results releases. Well, they release the results quarterly. Q1, Q2, of course, is the half year. But if you go back to 19, they have Q3. And of course, Q4 then is the full year results. So you have results on a quarterly basis. So that's what we call interim financial reporting. It's not the one big annual report. You're giving more regular ones during the year. This is only relevant to companies who are listed in stock exchanges. So if you have a listed uh, company, the likes of Ryanair, the likes of Greencore, the likes of Glanbia, Kerry Group, they will follow IAS 34 for those interim financial reporting. Right. Now, remember here, IAS 34 only tells you what way it should be presented. Right. It doesn't tell you which entities should publish them. It doesn't tell you how often. It doesn't tell you how soon after the period end. That is decided by the regulators in the stock exchange. So, for example, the Irish Stock Exchange will mandate quarterly reporting. The Irish Stock Exchange will tell Glambia, you have to have the results for quarter three published by a certain date. Because of course, the longer they are after that date, the less relevant they are. So IS34 only really tells you the standards about the information. So it outlines the recognition, measurement, disclosure. It doesn't tell you when they have to be done. That's left to regulators and stock exchanges. So it is relevant for PLC companies. And I've given you an example here of Glambia. Glambia report on a quarterly basis. So if we go to the um, AC220 loop page, you can see here Glambia's interim results for 2019. And this is the reference to IS34 on page 11 and page 17. So you'll see here they're half year results. So even though the full year isn't finished yet, investors want to know how are you getting on. So they want interim financial reporting. So we can see it's quite similar to slim down version. It's only 39 pages compared to the annual report. If you looked at it for uh, full year results, we'll get the annual report for 2019 for Glambia was 216 pages. So they're much slimmer, uh, but they still have the set of financial statements. If you look here, you still have a group income statement, but it's condensed because it's, it's not the full year end. Condensed statement contents of income, condensed balance sheet, they're condensed because that's under IS34. You're allowed to do a much smaller one just for the purpose of interim reporting. But if we look at page 17, look at the reference here. You can, we'll just control F because I'm sure IS34. You can see it here, page 11. They're, the director is responsible for preparing the half year reports. 
in accordance with IS34. See, prepared in accordance with IS34. And there's another IS34, basis of preparation on page 17. These are prepared in accordance with IS34. So it just shows you this is what they're done. This is how they're prepared for the interim. They still look very similar to a, a normal set of financial statements, the layout, but they're, they're smaller. There's less disclosure requirements. So your notes are actually only 10, 15 pages long because you don't have to give as many detailed notes and your financial statements aren't as detailed because this is only the interim report. When you come to the year end, like any normal financial statement, then IS34 is not relevant. IS34 is only relevant for those interim financial reporting, quarterly or half yearly. So they say the minimum components are your four set of financial statements, but they can all be condensed, like the way Glambia has condensed it, and selected notes. You don't have to give all notes out. Right? So they give you that flexibility that they know this probably has to be turned around a lot quicker. And remember, interim financial reports will not be audited. So that's slightly different as well, that they don't have the time to audit all of these and to go through a full audit process. So that's why there's a, there's a bit more focus on a condensed version. So limited notes are required and other disclosures such as seasonality, etc., are required. So for example, if you know that there's something seasonal about our business and this particular quarter is impacted by that, it must be disclosed. So it's the IS34 that are requiring that. So look, for that person, you don't really need to know a huge amount about IS34, other than number one, it exists. And number two, it's relevant for all PLC companies. So if you go to any PLC, if we go back to, for example, uh, Ryan or Greencore that we had, and we look at 2020, so this is just the reports, but if you we look at the results, the results center, We can see here there's a quarter four, quarter three, then you have half year, which of course is the um, quarter two. But what's nice, if you go into a lot of these, you can actually get the transcript. You can hear what you can hear what people are saying because you'll have your your analysts from all the investment banks. They're talking to the management and they're asking asking questions, and they save those calls. And you can actually listen back to them to see what were people were they happy with half year uh, 2020? Were they happy with the results? So let's look at the statement for the half year 2020, H1. They talk about COVID, right? They're talking about the summary financial performance, the comments from the senior management, and you come down along and you're going to get your financial statements in as well as normal. Down a small bit more. There's your condensed group income statement, condensed statement of comprehensive income, condensed statement of financial position. Same logic. So you, it's actually quite interesting to go back and have a look at that detail. You can actually look at the transcript. You can hear an audio recording at the conference call, or you can also see, um, you can also just read the transcript. So for example, the head of investor relations, the chairman of the board will talk, and most likely the CEO, Patrick Coveney, who of course is Simon Coveney's brother. He's the chief executive officer at Greencore. So they talk to them and then they give you the key highlights. But if you come down along then, Usually towards the end, there's a Q&A section. So Good Bodies, which is a stockbroker, their main person, their analyst, has a few questions. And you can see what questions they have and what they were answered. So Patrick Coveney answers that. Then, for example, you go Barclays Bank, big investment bank, ask a question. Then there's more niche ones, boutique investment banks. Uh, and so on and so forth. Davies, which is a well-known stockbroker in Ireland as well. Uh, so what you're looking at there, there's actually very interesting information if you do want to delve into it and have a look through it. Uh, but particularly what we're focusing on, of course, is all those interim financial reporting statements, they're all prepared under the guidance of IAS 34. And that's available in IAS Plus if you want as well. IAS 34, IAS Plus. It'll give you a nice summary of what is in IAS 34. It only came in in 1997, so this is a lot newer than the original IS1, and there's been a lot of tweaks since then. So it gives you a summary of what the key information is. So that's always a nice one, is the IES Plus website, and that's freely available. You don't need to log in or anything like that. Okay, so what we covered there was hopefully in the majority a recap of IS1. 
I'll do a separate recording now of an IAS1 question, just to refresh your memory on journal entries and how to go from a trial balance and adjustments to a finished set of financial statements. And you need to look around in question three as well and keep an eye out for the other material in the week five pack that you can be completing uh, next week, which is reading week for AF2. So thank you very much again, and apologies for the, the short notice cancellation of the lecture, but hopefully you found this um, recording useful, and please do reach out via email if you have any questions at all.